thank you to the North Olympic Library System um, for helping to um, put on the speaker series uh, this year. My name is Dean Butterworth. I am the Outreach and Education Specialist at Olympic National Park. And this is the last presentation in this winter's uh, perspective series. And so we um, thank you all for taking your time to be here. And if you attended previous sessions, we hope that you uh, found those interesting and engaging. Um, and we look forward to hosting another uh, round of perspectives talks next winter, beginning in November. Um, today, we will be very lucky to hear from um, Professor David Coles from um, Powell, sorry, from um, the uh, Walla Walla University, um, and he will be presenting on um, Asian clams, which have recently been observed um, here on the Olympic Peninsula. So I will turn the time over to David and let him take it away for us. Thank you for inviting me to come out and present. I, I Olympic Peninsula is, is very dear to my, my heart. In fact, I, I grew up in Forks. Uh, I have a number of family that's still there, have fairly strong roots uh, out there. My, my grandmother, Meg de Kimley, was one of the first two European girls to be in Forks, and my mother grew up there. Uh, my father was a soldier in World War II through the Pacific and uh, started writing to to my mother, my mother started writing to him while he was a soldier during the war. And so he came after the war ended over there to visit with her and fell in love with her and, and with the place too. And uh, was in awe of the, the lush forests and so forth there. So uh, they got married and our family's been there ever since. Dad, before uh, he was there very long, uh, he, he put away his gun and he hung up his hunting bow that he'd been using and, and uh, was was so in awe of, of the the forest there that he he got his a, a dream job of building trails uh, in Olympic National Park and uh, began writing about what he was experiencing. Maybe if, if any of your old timers, you may remember from the Port Angeles Daily News the Woods and Waters column that he wrote for years there, <clears throat> and uh, also a, a book that he wrote about letters from Olympus, uh, things that he wrote while being while working on the trails up in Olympic National Park. We lived in the, in the forest, of course, out by Forks, and and uh, he took us on a lot of trips across uh, country, compass, uh, visiting the beach, visiting the mountains up through the trails. I remember well as, as a child, he took me for a week's uh, trip by pack train horses up, up the Queets, where he was rebuilding the trail after a, a blowdown there. Um, he had topographical maps of much of the northern and wet, uh, northwestern peninsula. So we used those a lot. I explored a lot on my own, often by compass, um, learning so much about the peninsula there. Dad, Dad died suddenly in 1976, but by then I'd, I'd fully caught the bug of, of learning about and oh, no. loving and teaching about the, the Olympic Peninsula and natural systems like that. So I went to college and eventually got my doctorate. And uh, since then I've been studying and teaching about biology and ecology. I have my own dream job of working at a university uh, in, bi in biology, uh, studying these things. I got more directly involved uh, back with the uh, Olympic Peninsula out there and studying freshwater clams uh, with the Elwha Dam removal. When I joined that group and started studying the what, what was happening with the freshwater clams there in the river, because most people know about clams out at the ocean, but are not realizing there are a number of species of clams in our in our freshwater bodies as well. And because of that uh, experience there and working with others on the Elwha, uh, one in, in 2018, uh, invasive clams were discovered near Lake Ozette. Um, I was invited by Olympic National Park fisheries scientist uh, Pat Crane to, to come and, and see what we could do there. Uh, I really, I was glad to do that because I, I really love uh, nature, especially I consider Olympic Peninsula my home, although I'm not living there right now. So it was a real privilege to have a small part in caring for some of what I, I think most of us would consider some of the jewels Treasures of Olympic Peninsula, Lake Ozette, and Lake Crescent is what this uh, this talk is about. So let's move on and see what's happening there. First of all, the clam. 
the real name is Corbicula fluminea, uh, but it's called the Asian or golden clam. Actually, I understand that in Asia, it's also called the prosperity clam, probably because it grows so uh, abundantly that uh, it doesn't take much to grow and, and uh, it is edible. So uh, in Asia, it is, is used as, as food. Um, as I say, it's, it's a small freshwater clam. It has a golden surface coat on it, as you can, as you can see in the in the, the the diagram here that's called the periostracum and it stands out it's it's quite quite easily uh, seen uh, distinguished from other types of clams it was first reported here uh, in the United States in the in the Columbia River near Portland just downstream away from Portland in 1938 uh, but it spread rapidly across the United States here's a, a picture recently of, of where it is uh, found all over the place, spread explosively here. This actually, you can you can show this year by year and it's just exploding in population across there. But notice, here's the Columbia River right here, but there's really nothing on the peninsula except for that one right there. And that's the one I start this talk talking about. Uh, fortunately, we had, we had been missing it. Uh, now there's 26,000 places where it uh, uh, appears in the United States there. Um, this cl this clam, uh, I, I I just automatically call it corbicula. So forgive me, it's the Asian clam that I'm talking about there. Uh, it has lots of features which would seem to aid it in in invading so many places. There, for example, it's very often it's a hermaphrodite, which means it's both male and female. And this is a simultaneous hermaphrodite, so it can readily fertilize itself. And what that means is, one of the things it means is that even one individual can, can colonize a whole area. If one individual gets there, you can have many thousands of them uh, before very long. So it's, it's very, very aggressive uh, in that way. It also is really efficient and has, has a rapid growth rate. Uh, it, it filters a, a large amount of water. They're filter feeders. Uh, it filters plankton out of the water. A larger amount of, of water they filter per day per their size of most things. And it's very efficient at assimilating the food that it gets. So it's, it's very efficient at taking the food out of the water there. In fact, it has the highest net production efficiency of any freshwater clam that has been studied up until, I don't know if that's true today, but it was true not, not very long ago. So the implication for that, one important implication is if, if there's enough resources for any clam species to live there, likely this one can live there uh, as well. It also matures rapidly. Uh, it, uh, five days after the egg is fertilized, uh, it has already gone through its larval stages and it can be released from the mother as, as a post larva. And then in as little as three to six months, it's an adult and pumping out uh, babies of its own there. So even, you know, born in early summer, by late summer, uh, it can be having babies of its own that it's, that it's pumping out. And it has voluminous reproduction. Adults can pump out up to 400 post larvae per day. Uh, and it can accumulate to hundreds or even thousands of them per square meter or per square yard. Uh, literature talks about up to say 20,000 per square meter. So these things really get huge populations uh, there. We've all heard of zebra mussels and they're, they're moving into other areas, fortunately not in the Pacific Northwest here yet, but one of the most important things about them is they have these strong threads they hang on to things, so they'll dogpile upon the native mussels. Did you know that, that uh, the, the world center for native mussels is North America, but it's mostly in the eastern North America. We have just a few species of native mussels, native clams here uh, in the west. This one has just weak bissel threads, so you won't get 200 of these all piling on top of one of our native clams, but you just have, they just overwhelm them by having so many there. And they can, especially when they're young, they can use these bissel threads to hold on to something, and then we'll come, we'll come back and discuss that a little bit uh, later. There are some things about, uh, about these clams that makes it seem to be unlike to, they'd be a very efficient uh, invasive species. For example, they're really sensitive, unusually sensitive to low oxygen. And so populations, if they get in a very low oxygen condition, you can have mass die-offs there. And so that's that's that can set back their invasion, but actually it's a problem too because when you get thousands of clams per square meter and they all die off suddenly and all rot at once, uh, they they deplete the oxygen in that area and also produce a lot of ammonia, which is poisonous to anything else which is around there. So that that definitely can be a problem uh, with them. 
unlike our, our native uh, clams, our, our native clams have a larva called a glochidia, and they actually uh, ca catch a ride. The babies catch a ride on fish, and that's how they can move from place to place. Uh, these clams don't do that. They don't, they don't hitch a ride. They don't have a glochidia larva at all. In, in fact, uh, they're, they're brooded in their parents' gills for just a few days. I mentioned that five days, and they go through their normal larval, larval stages. Most baby clams can swim to someplace else, but these, these live in their, their mother's gills, they're protected there by their mother, until they've, they've passed that stage. And you can see on the bottom left here what they look like. They're called a D larva uh, when they're released. And the D larva is pretty well finished with swimming. It's ready to settle to the bottom. You see it has this little shell that's starting and there's a foot here and so forth. So uh, it might, it has a little bit of, of, cilia, of cilia here that it can swim just a little bit, but like inches, you know, it really can't swim very far uh, at all. They, uh, there are some ducks that ingest them. Uh, and that might be able to transport them somewhere else, so you'd think, but but it appears that uh, they pretty well die in the in the duck's gut. So it's not likely that they'd be transported very efficiently uh, by ducks. So how does it get around? Well, in rivers, uh, they clearly uh, can be swept along by the current. Uh, the Columbia River has uh, some scientists down in, in uh, Portland studying them, and they, they definitely uh, can find them up in the water column there. The turbulence of the water is enough when they're babies, at least, to bring them up uh, into the, the water column there. And small individuals uh, can, can anchor to things. A lot of times they'll just anchor to a little rock on the bottom or a piece of wood or something just to hold them in place. But if they anchor to something else that's moving like a boat or something like that, it might be a way that they move to uh, new spots. We don't know for sure whether that's something they do very much because it's usually when they show up in a new place, it's kind of a mystery how they got there, but that might be one, one way. Um, another interesting thing they can do is they can stand upright, kind of like you see some of these clams in here standing upright. And they, uh, when they're small, they can start secreting a, a strand of mucus, which uh, they release and it kind of balloons. Somehow it gathers bubbles uh, and it can actually uh, go along like a balloon, like they're hanging on to a helium balloon that's, that's uh, riding them along. Uh, that's been reported in the literature, but they don't seem to be able to do that very far. Maybe a meter or two is what's been reported. That's about as far as they seem to be able to move that way by hanging onto that balloon. However, we from from rec records of, of where they're all those records we were seeing of, of where they're found now, they clearly can move upstream uh, in some way. It's not exactly how that is. Even up to 10 to 13 kilometers per year uh, reported in the literature going going up river, but it's not clear. Probably humans had a lot to do with it, you know, fishermen, boats, uh, and just accidental transports by somehow, it seems especially humans uh, are involved in that. So that leads us then uh, to Lake Ozette. As I said, it was it was discovered in the Ozette River just downstream from Lake Ozette, just downstream and, and around the ranger station there in late summer of 2018. Notice from that map that I showed you before, the, the whole Olympic Peninsula and certainly the Olympic National Park has been basically essentially free of perbicular. There might have been some small report over near Squimmer Port Townsend. Um, but other than that, the peninsula has pretty well just been an open spot there uh, on the map. But in late summer 2018, it was detected way over in Lake Oz in, in the Ozette River there. And uh, Pat Crane and I started, started working at, at that point. Uh, then to set up a cooperative agreement between uh, Walla Walla University, the, where I work, and Olympic National Park, uh, in which I would bring out a group of, of university students to further investigate uh, what's happening with corbicula, with the clam there. Uh, is it spreading into the lake? And what's its potential impact on, on native species? And there's a lot of reasons for us to be concerned about that. First of all, you know, Ozette, Lake Ozette, like Lake Crescent, is, is I think one of the treasures we have there on the peninsula, one of the biggest lakes in Washington state uh, actually, has a diverse, mostly native flora and, and, and fauna that's there. Startlingly high diversity. I was surprised to find uh, at least over 50 different native aquatic plants living around Lake Ozette. There's, there's lots of variety of plants uh, that are there, including one called water lobelia, uh, which is a, a species of concern uh, in Washington state. It's a small plant that lives in undisturbed water bodies. 
but it seems like as, as soon as people start coming around, it just seems to die out uh, in areas and disappear. And so it, it's hard to find water lobelia in, in a lot of places. And I'll be coming back and visiting that. That's one we had special interest in to see uh, what what the status of water lobelia was in, in Lake OZ and, and whether these curricula might have something to do with it. Also, you're probably aware that there's a, a number of species of salmonids have historically come into Lake OZ and that there's sockeye salmon uh, there now that are of, of concern. Uh, it's an ESA listed sockeye salmon uh, run there. And also uh, our, our waters here in the Olympic Peninsula, our, our rivers and lakes uh, contain some native mussels and I'll, I'll try to avoid using the scientific name for them. Let's just call them pearl shells. The Western pearl shell uh, is one common type that we have here, mostly in rivers, but uh, a little bit in lakes. And then floaters, which are more in lakes uh, than in rivers. Those are the common names for the mussels, and we'll see some. And of course, there's there's a lot of interest in, in things like Lake Ozette, Olympic National Park, for sure, the Macaw and Quileute tribe that have traditionally been using uh, those waters, and of course, all of us as as responsible Olympic Peninsula citizens that, that love our, the environment we have here, it's a concern to, to all of us. So let's take a look at what we did and what we found. We started out with a preliminary survey uh, in 2019. I brought out a small group of students to take a look. They were known to be here in the Ozette River and what's happened, of course, this is the Ozette River. There's the main boat, la boat launch dock uh, of the Ozette River, and it's a 100 yards or so downstream from the lake uh, itself. So our hope was with the river flowing downstream here uh, that and, and the fact that they couldn't swim, uh, that maybe they hadn't spread into the lake, you know, that maybe they had just gone, hard to stop them from going downstream, but maybe they hadn't gone upstream. Also, if we looked in the literature, there's some places that had put down a, a barrier on the bottom that stopped them from settling into the substrate and seemed that it was having some success anyway and we thought well maybe a barrier could be put between the dock here where they were and up in the lake itself that might stop them from spreading uh, into the lake. So we spent some time there at the lake uh, discovering that and uh, found out uh, sadly that it's uh, many corbicula probably a hundred million or more uh, had already entered the lake they'd spread about a third of the way down the lake you can see the this is down to Erickson's Bay here uh, and in, into uh, Swan Bay, uh, uh, near the Swan Bay entrance. Uh, they were on all the, all the shores here, especially on the west shore already. Uh, it was certainly too late for a map barrier. Can't close the barn door, the horse is long out. Uh, and also we went down the river and they'd spread in massive numbers, just thousands and thousands and thousands of them down, down the river there. The river also had quite a few native mussels, the, the pearl shell mussels are very common in the river, uh, very abundant there, but far outnumbered even already by the, at least in numbers, by the corbicula clams that were spreading down the river rapidly. 2020, the, the, the plan then was we, we laid out, we divided up Lake Ozette shoreline into 100 meter uh, segments uh, here, which are all identified and mapped. Uh, and then our, our our plan was to look segment by segment down the down the lake here and and uh, uh, record for each one of those segments what the status was, whether what the what the native plants were like there, what the native mussels were like there, uh, and whether corbicula was invaded there, and whether there seemed to be any particular interactions that were there. Well, that was the plan for 2020, and as as we're all aware, uh, things happened in 2020. It wasn't a normal year at all, and uh, became pretty obvious as the year got in, got into that that we weren't going to be having a group of students there studying that year. So, but the corbicula didn't care about that, and they were spreading down the lake anyway. And I wanted to keep track and uh, what's actually happening there. So, in the summertime, my wife and I came there and just spent some time. Uh, making spot checks at least around the lake shore to see what's happening. And you can see the marks here where we actually made the spot checks, found that it certainly had spread farther, uh, especially down the west shore uh, here. Um, it hadn't, it, it's farther down south here where the critical, there's a small population of sockeye which are breeding on the shores of the lake. Uh, it had not reached where those sockeye were yet uh, there. Um, and one thing, given the fact that they can't swim, um, they're said to not be able to swim anyway. 
Uh, after searching about half an hour out here on one of the shores of Garden Island, I discovered one, just one individual out there. And even if the search just a little bit farther down the island, there was zero. So it appeared that you know they're, they're spreading along the shore for sure, but somehow they can make this is this is about half a kilometer uh, out to there. So you know, thousand yards or so, um, eight hundred yards maybe. Uh, so somehow uh, they got out to there. Now it's possible they rode on a boat out there because people do visit Garden Island sometimes by boat. But kind of a puzzle how they would have gotten there. As we look farther south here. Number of places we tested down here in the south, no, no evidence at all. Inside Swan Bay here, no evidence. Uh, and Boot Bay, no evidence of any corbicula uh, there. Well, that led then to uh, the, we, we, had, we had gotten enough preliminary information and we got, had been able to bring students back in, in 2021, had planned a three week uh, study there of working our way around the lake like that to catalog uh, the corbicula that was there, and as I said, the native uh, vegetation and mussels, and looking for any signs of interaction between them. And the basic uh, research design then was to have three surveyors along the shoreline, and plus a boat along, it's me out on the boat there, uh, and to document, as I said, 100 uh, uh, meter intervals here. We had one person right along the shore that's documenting whether they're in the shallow water here and what the vegetation is right on the shoreline and, and in the water here. Then two snorkelers, uh, uh, stationed farther and farther out. The farthest one was swimming out to a meter deep water uh, out here. So it was um, up to about 20 meters. So about 60, 65 feet uh, out from the shore on average going around the lake, uh, studying uh, that area there. So we were able to, uh, to survey much uh, of the lake. The green here shows the actual uh, places we did survey, the redder places we skipped. We skipped those for several reasons. Um, either it was private property, like over here, uh, several places with private property, we left those because we hadn't gotten any formal uh, permit to, to go there, uh, contacted them. Uh, there were places that were hazards, lots of, of, of loose brush and everything, down trees into the water where it's not safe for snorkelers uh, to go through there. Uh, and some places in here, there's lots and lots of mud and, and reeds and water lilies. And uh, the corbicula and, and native mussels, for that matter, didn't seem to live there at all. Uh, and that's a really good place to encounter uh, leeches, <laughs> which our swimmers didn't appreciate. So we, we skipped uh, some of those places. Here's what we found out uh, in 2021. Here's, what, here's where they had spread in 2019. Here's where they had spread in 2020. And then here's the map for, for 2021. Uh, found several. Uh, important things. Lobelia, that water lobelia I was talking about, is very abundant along the shore. There's lots of water lobelia here. This is this is something to watch out for. There's lots of it there. We'll come back and visit that uh, later. As far as the golden clam corbicula spreading, uh, they had certainly spread uh, farther. Now they're down far enough that they've entered the sockeye spawning grounds here on the western shore. The Garden Island population, the year before, I'd barely been able, after a long search, to find one live individual. There were many thousands of them there uh, on, on Garden Island, uh, on that side and down to this side uh, as well uh, there. Furthermore, they jumped across the Swan Bay entrance here, about another kilometer there, across to this side, and it spread several kilometers down the shore uh, here on the east side uh, of the lake. Uh, I, I went out to Tivoli Island here then and spent quite a while of searching here. And again, after about half an hour search, I found one live one there. And of course, my my stomach fell, you know. Oh, oh dear, there's that. It's Tivoli Island uh, as well. There, They have reached the sockeye spawning grounds on the left-hand side. They were very close here. We did not find any in the spa spawning grounds here to the east, uh, but they were very close. And by the rate that they were spreading, by, you know, that was 2021, uh, no doubt they're, they're farther there. They seem to flourish the best in, in silt, but gravel. There's uh, almost all the silt around Lake Ozette has, has gravel uh, pretty close there too. And that seemed to be the, the, the type of habitat that they, they flourished best in. They, they could be found in, among boulders. Uh, they were not very common in sand, like up here in Erickson's Bay, you know, the nice sandy beaches there. And in muddy places back here, they're essentially absent. They just don't well, they don't live in low oxygen and mud is low on oxygen. We just don't see them living there. 
A second study that we did there, besides the physical survey of looking around, is we took an eDNA, an environmental DNA, where we went out and took water samples at every place where we have have the, uh, the, the big circles here. The small circles are a map of where, what we saw on shore, where the, where the corbicula were. So dark red means lots and lots of them. Uh, light red means less. Um, and gray means we didn't find them at all, like down here. Then we did an eDNA study. This is about every two kilometers here, about roughly every mile, a little over a mile apart from one another, and, and a little closer together where we knew the edge was from them. We took water samples and sent it over to the Department of Fish and Wildlife at uh, Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife to uh, examine the water there to see if there's any uh, DNA from corbicula in the water. And bright, dark red here means yes, there's lots of DNA, strong indication that corbicula is there. Uh, then yellow means, okay, it's not nearly so strong. Green means you can barely detect some and dark green means, okay, only one, 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 test out of, out of nine of them even detected it. And then white said it was not detected, but notice there's no white. <laughs> so we certainly, it, it, it was very, eDNA said very strongly, yes, you have it all the way through here, even in places back here where we didn't see any back in Swan Bay, it's close enough. It looks like if, even if it's a little ways away, like here, uh, the DNA can drift through the water and get there. The south end of the lake at that time was giving some positives, but not nearly as positive. I'm very confident that they've spread clear to the south end of the lake uh, by now, however. Thinking about then how it, it, it may interact with species uh, that are there. First of all, looking at water lobelia. This is water lobelia right here, this small plant that lives on the bottom. Sometimes you can see a stalk coming up from it because they make a little tiny flower and, and it grows up to the surface when it's time to bloom uh, there. Here's water lobelia. There's some water lobelia uh, right there. Um, it flourishes here in the silty areas with gravel. That's exactly where corbicula, see there's one right there, uh, where corbicula uh, uh, flourishes as well. And um, so they favor similar substrates. Corbicula is, is active and it keeps burrowing around. Here you can see places where it's been digging up uh, the substrate. And if, if I were to dig my hand in the sand here, each handful would probably come up with a dozen corbicula that's under the sand there. But they keep moving around and, and, and digging up the sand and eating particles out of it with their foot. So they not only can filter feed, up in the water column, but they're eating stuff out of the sediment uh, as well there. And that is a, a potential problem because this corbicula, maybe this is why it seems to disappear around where people are, because if people are in the water much, you know, it lives in the silt here, but if you step on the silt or sandy areas, uh, if it disturbs them, if you're even stepping very close, they'll just pop up to the surface like this. They have what's called arenchyma in their tissues that, that helps get oxygen down to their roots, which are down here. There may be low oxygen in the, in the sediment itself. But the fact that they have those oxygen channels there means that they float very easily and their, their, their roots are short. So if you step close by, if it just it distorts that sediment a little bit, they can just poof, pop right up to the surface like this when they weren't even touched. And I, I'm concerned that these carbicula, which are constantly digging around here and love these kinds of spots to live, they may well uproot some of these uh, as well. And of course, if you had major die-offs, they could easily damage the lobelia. It seems to be a sensitive plant uh, as well. So that's one concern uh, that's there. Looking at the, the freshwater mussels, this is one of the types that's really common in a lake. They're called floaters or anodonta is the other name. Um, this is a much larger mussel, as you can see. Uh, here, they're called a mussel. They're not related to the, you know, the mussels we have out at the ocean. They're just shaped kind of like a mussel, so they call them that. There's, there's no close relative uh, at all. These mussels also live in silt with gravel areas. Oh, by the way, here's some of the, uh, some of the, the uh, lobelia, again, actually right there. Um, so they're going to be living in a, in a similar habitat, um, and they're probably going to compete for food. The, the corbicula is a, is, is a powerful a, a filter feeder is going to be a, a very formidable uh, competition to our native mussels uh, for food there. Plus, when these, when they're young, when they're really small, they settle to the bottom. Who knows? They may be either eaten or the corbicula rooting around in there where the babies are trying to get established in the sediment may keep throwing them out again. Now, they seem to be able to live on the surface, okay, but you know, the, the fact that their, their habitat, their preferred habitat is right smack in the same way that the corbicula is a potential problem there. 
we did have in Lake, uh, so there are about 65,000 uh, of, the, of the floaters that we encountered there in that narrow shoreline. We also about 40, 45,000 of these pearl shells, the other common native species here, we encountered uh, as well. They're flourishing also near the shore, but the pearl shells tend to be in much rockier areas is where they, they do better. So their, their habitat does not overlap quite as much, likely still going to compete for food, but uh, they're in slightly different areas, so it may be less. Um, I just had to, we, of all those that we went across, we only found one place. Here's a small corbicula that's attached by its little bissel thread to one of these clams. So they didn't do it very much, not like the zebra mussels, but there's a little bit of that possible uh, there. They're they're churning around in the in the sand, in the the silt and, and whatever the gravel may disturb uh, the the adult. Uh, other papers in, in other places have mentioned uh, mussels of this general type. Uh, just studying a place after corbicula has moved in, and you just find less adult mussels there. So they may disturb them in some ways. I'm guessing less important than than with the the floaters. Uh, but the the babies when they settle likely to have a problem here. And if you get a big die off, these things are really sensitive uh, and it may well uh, be a problem for them, C kill the native mussels as well. The sockeye salmon, um, the, the corbicula stirs up sediment. Fortunately, the sockeye salmon try to choose places that have less sediment, but all the places where they are spawning in, in Lake Ozette does have sediment. So uh, certainly the corbicula is going to be there in, in, in the last few places where they're successfully spawning. Uh, they may go digging around in the sediment, digging up sockeye eggs. Hopefully the sockeye will bury them a little bit deeper. Uh, if they're throwing up sediment into piles, that may asphyxiate the eggs by extra sediment there or disturb the young when they're, you know, after they've hatched or before they swim off. Uh, certainly if you had a mass die off of curbiculate in there, it's going to poison anything around, including the sockeye eggs uh, or young. And, and uh, if they're healthy, they're very, very efficient at feeding in the sockeye when they're young. They're eating some plankton there. And so they may directly or indirectly uh, be competing with uh, the baby sockeye salmon as well. But there's a freak chance it might be, they might actually help the sockeye salmon in, in a little bit anyway. Um, if stirring the sediment, they might help to oxygenate it a little bit. That seems to be one of the issues there in Lake Ozette. They may not be getting enough oxygen in this tissue there. And could it even be that those young sockeye salmon uh, might be able to eat some of the, the babies, the young corbicula? Maybe there'll be plenty of them there, let me tell you. Uh, okay, so summary of Lake Ozette, uh, they're, they're clearly spreading rapidly down Lake Ozette. It's not clear exactly how they got the, into the river uh, by the lake, but they certainly did. Uh, they're very abundant near the shoreline and may impact a variety of the different sensitive native species like I was just talking about. Uh, it's too late to stop them. They're, they're very likely, almost certain, they're here to stay and to be a dominant species. The most abundant species along the shoreline there is, is almost certain to be corbicula for the foreseeable future. Uh, and their, their impacts there may come from the fact that they're very efficient at filtering all the plankton out of the water, disturbing the sediment or mass die-offs. Any one of those could be a problem there. Um, there might be a freak chance they might help uh, something like the sockeye, perhaps. So that leads on then to Lake Crescent. Let's take a look there. Uh, be, at, at the time when they were discovered to be there in Lake Ozette, we thought we'd better check on Lake Crescent as well. And of course, Lake Crescent is a rather different lake. Here's a video of us surveying there. The water looks very different uh, there. There have been no sightings reported of, of cor cor corbicula in Lake Crescent, but uh, someone from the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife had been just kind of taking DNA samples here and there and went to the Barnes Creek dock and took a sample there and it had a weak positive. You know, one of those one out of nine, I think it was, said, yes, uh, there, there might be corbicula somewhere around here. Well, sometimes you get, you get a false positive, but you know, that's something of a concern uh, then. So we set up a, a similar research design uh, in Lake Ozette as we had in Lake in Lake Crescent, as we had in Lake Ozette. Uh, and Lake Crescent, of course, the, the, the shore, the, the bottom goes down much faster, as you can see here. Uh, so we sampled out a little farther to two meters depth. Uh, we couldn't sample much deeper than that. And we were hoping those preliminary results were wrong and we didn't see anything there. So we, we did this study in, in this last summer, 22, our results, unfortunately, we, well, we found many native mussels, not nearly as many as in Lake Ozette, maybe one-tenth as many, but lots of native mussels 
almost totally floaters, uh, hardly any uh, of the pearl shells. Pearl shells mostly live in rivers, uh, but there are many living in Lake Ozette. And in the Ozette River, I understand, I didn't study it myself, but others that have said there's many there. Uh, there's also quite a bit of the lobelia around the shores of, of Lake Crescent. Here and there, not anywhere close to as much as is in Lake uh, Ozette. But if you see little patches of, 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 sand, of sand or silt and a little bit of small vegetation there growing around the, the, the sides of Lake Crescent, it's often the water lobelia. This, this one is very sensitive to disturbance. There's very few other native plants. I said 50 species or more than 50 species in Lake Ozette. Um, just a few uh, other things in, in Lake Crescent, not nearly as abundant as we all know. It's a, it's a ultra oligotrophic lake. You know, it's, it's very clear there's not much food there um, and not many plants uh, growing there either. Also along the shallow part of the shore, there's really not very much sediment there in Lake uh, Crescent. So not as much for the plants or or the clams to be in for that matter. Here's the results though with corbicula. Unfortunately, we, we, we started over here and went around the lake. And what it showed here, the, the grayest places we didn't survey because it was a private property, pretty well everywhere else uh, we, we surveyed around this lake. Uh, and the white is really nice here. That's places we surveyed and didn't, didn't encounter a thing as far as corbicula is around the lake. But unfortunately, here at Barnes Point, we couldn't do this private property right here, but here at the boat launch at Barnes Point, we found lots and lots and lots of them right there at the dock. Way too many. They've spread a few hundred meters here to the east and, and clear around here a kilometer or more to the west. We couldn't test it there, but you get down here to Lake Crescent Lodge. They're abundant there on this point and can be found right about to the end of Lake Crescent Lodge here. Uh, last summer, that's where they were. Uh, we couldn't find anything uh, beyond that, as you can see here. So that was encouraging and nowhere else around the lake, except surprisingly, whoa, right straight across from there, there was just a little patch there along the shore uh, with just a few corbicula. And it's like, what are you doing here? How'd you get here? Uh, the lake is, is you know, really deep. You go across there, you wouldn't think they could get across the bottom very well, and they're not supposed to be able to swim. Maybe a boat might take them across there. That is possible. But the, the fact that it's right here, or you get an abundant bunch here, and then just a few, just a handful, like half a dozen or less, we found over there, directly across from the peak says, did they swim somehow? How can they get across to there? Well, elsewhere, also over here at Log Cabin Resort, is one other spot on the lake where we found also not a lot, but there's, there's some there. Fairholm has none. No, no, we couldn't find no indication of any corbicula there. We got some divers here to see what is it like out farther from the dock here. And they went down to 60 feet, and this is taken at about 60 feet down there. You get down in deeper water, there's more silt uh, in Lake Crescent. And this silt is only about an inch or two deep, and then it's gravel underneath that. But look, all those, that's corbicula. They're all over the place there. Thousands and thousands of them uh, out there. Uh, the, the sediment, there's, there, there's plenty in Lake Crescent right now. It's pretty well 100% just right here, uh, but they're, they're there in the lake as well. It's too late, they're, they're going to be there. We did an eDNA test uh, here, just like we did uh, in, in Lake Ozette. Uh, and you can see the places here where we found it, uh, where we, we, we didn't survey, here's where we didn't see it, and there's where we found it. But here's the eDNA in there. So that's discouraging as well, because see, we can see here around where, out farther from where we could see them, there's a strong signal in the water that, of, of corbicula now. And if we go away from there, this is a, a weaker signal, but across here now there's a weaker signal. There's a signal over here. There's a signal up here by Log Cabin Resort spread around the lake there. No sign yet here in the eastern part of the lake. No sign yet around Fairholme uh, on this western end, but these are spreading. So it's just showing they're, they're, they're coming in Lake uh, Crescent as well. While we were there, while we, while we were taking these eDNA samples here in Lake Crescent, there is another species of concern here in Washington, and it's called the New Zealand mud snail. It's a tiny, tiny little snail, as you can see here. And so we, we kept our eye out while we we're searching around, and we saw some tiny snails here and there, and tentatively identified them as New Zealand mud snail. That, that was uh, confirmed later, but we found them in just a few spots. So we did an eDNA study around the lake as well. 
And here's our here's our results. Strong positive here at Barnes Point. Strong positive over here at uh, at uh, the Log Cabin Resort. Strong positive along this east coast here and around to the, where the Ranger Station labs are there. Coming clear out here. Some spots, none. So zero. Can't finding them there. But here's a spot on the North Shore and clear over here at Fairholme. So New Zealand mud snails are moving in as well. I have not studied them as much. I don't know their effects on other things. I do know that they become extremely abundant. They they often live around uh, uh, in mud, of course, with a name like that, but you can often find them under stones and so forth, and very small uh, snails like that, spreading through various places in Washington and definitely there in Lake Crescent. But we did not test for them on Lake that. Well, I wish I had a better story to tell, but that's the, that's the story that's there. Question is then, uh, what what can be done? What's the what's the what's the prognosis or the things we can do about that? Well, at this point, I'd say it's they're there in the lakes to stay. It's it's impractical to eradicate them. Uh, anything that can get rid of them is going to have devastating impact on the on the native things that are there as well. So, corbicula is likely to be the dominant invertebrate and the dominant filter feeder for the foreseeable future in both lakes. Unfortunately. Uh, think about this with this deep photo down there. That's taken down at 60 feet. That's far below the surface. Uh, your your plankton is appearing is is up there at the surface, near the surface, where it can get enough uh, light for photosynthesis. And there's going to be plankton down here. But the native mussels in this lake are found maybe one every 10 square meters if you're lucky. There's not a lot of food in Lake Crescent. Uh, for the native kind of things, and and to support them, you know, can support about one every every ten square meters or so. If these carbicula are able to live, they had to have have enough food here to be thriving to get down here and having this many there. They are just way way more abundant than the, than the native things there. They are going to dominate, uh, e even in these ultra oligotrophic conditions. They're going to dominate there for the foreseeable future. Un unfortunately. So what can be done? Well, uh, they live very well in rivers. No one's reported them in rivers yet in the Olympic Peninsula or other lakes, you know, Lake Sutherland, for example. We haven't tested Lake Sutherland. Who knows if they're there or not? They come in in boats. You'd expect them to be in Lake Sutherland before they are in, in Lake Ozette. Uh, but other rivers, uh, certainly trying to uh, avoid their spread reminding people to inspect and clean their boats that can be pretty small even on, on boats you know wipe your boats down don't take it from one lake to another quickly leave it out of the water for a while apparently they can survive well adults can survive up to a few weeks out of out of water but the little ones are probably much shorter uh, time than that so we can try to get the word out warning against handling and moving these things but prevention is really just about the only the only arrow in the quiver uh, at this point. Once they enter a new body of water, uh, it's virtually impossible to get rid of them there. So, uh, sorry to spread the bad news, but that's the news I have. Uh, work like this involves a, a lot of teams working together for different things and just wanted to acknowledge uh, mostly students here uh, from Walla Walla University. Uh, Rosera Beach Marine Laboratory University owns uh, out near Anacortes, and that was kind of our jumping off point to come out in here, and uh, the, the director there and, and so forth at the station has been very helpful to us. My great thanks to Olympic National Park for their, their help and support during this whole project, and specifically uh, several of the, of the scientists there. Macaw Tribal Fisheries and Washington Department of Ecology and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have, have been very helpful as well, so we're very thankful uh, for that. With that, kind of like to open it up then for for questions you might have, uh, things that, uh, that that we could talk about there. And so, any questions? I'm glad to entertain those. All right, thanks, David, so much for a very fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, although the the end result is kind of depressing, um, yes. but uh, it's good to. Good to know about this and like you said we can maybe prevent spread to further um, bodies of water um kelsey uh, redland had asked about what about lake sutherland but i think at the end you answered that um that there's not been any 
testing or sampling done in Lake Sutherland for these uh, for the curricula? That is true, uh, but partly true. And that's, that's true, but there is one thing. Uh, this last summer, when I finished at Lake Crescent, I had a little bit of an opportunity for some more eDNA studies. So uh, I went to Indian Creek, right where it runs out of Lake Sutherland. It, it almost immediately goes under the highway very shortly after leaving the lake. And, and seeing how, you know, in the lakes, if corbicula is even anywhere close by, there's enough DNA in the water that DNA tests can, can find it. So I took a sample of the creek there and it came up zero for corbicula. So it's it, pretty confident that they're, they're certainly not abundant. Uh, in Lake uh, Sutherland, they, they could be getting established there any any time, but right now they don't seem to be much, if any, there. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, I uh, April Atwood asks, I wonder if there could be a way to encourage harvesting the invasive clams and that maybe uh, some chefs could come up with something delicious that would uh, encourage well, their harvesting. Yeah. They're quite small, but they are eaten in Asia. Um, and, and so, you know, they're, they're certainly edible uh, to be eaten here. I haven't tried any of them. But th the problem is uh, they certainly could be harvested, but they're, they're so much more abundant than the native species. Uh, and they live in similar areas that you're probably going to do uh, a great deal of damage to the native species, especially in Lake Ozette, the things like the water lobelia, you know, that seems so sensitive to even someone walking close by. Uh, and the harvest is is not going to, to cut them back. You know, they grow so fast and so abundantly that uh, uh, it would be it would be stunning if uh, if we could get enough people out there harvesting to make make a measurable difference in mm. in uh, how fast they're spreading. And does there appear to be any natural or, or um, native predators uh, predation to the clams? Well, as I was saying, if, as I look in the literature in, in other places in the U.S. where they've studied them, they, they do seem to be eaten by some ducks and maybe about some, some, some bottom fish, you know, uh, things like catfish and so forth that we don't really have here uh, may eat them. But that doesn't seem to have much effect on, on limiting their populations. You say, okay, yes, I found it came out of the fish's gut here, but there's still plenty more where those came from. Okay. Um, well, there, uh, we don't have any more questions. So if folks have questions, go ahead and uh, put those right in the chat and we'll uh, answer those. We still have a, uh, a few more minutes of David's time and Sarah's time at the library. So um, I'm curious, the connections between human um, activities and the presence or absence of the clams um, is, I know that you probably anecdotally, could you say something of like, if there's more use of the people walking around on, on the, the bottom of the lakeshore swimming or things like that, would that, you know, in your opinion, would that have an impact on the numbers of clams found in those areas? Uh, it, it, it may kill some individual clams. It probably would. Um, and people just, you know, playing around. Uh, you can, well, this, this picture actually is is uh, taken by a diver. This is a diver's glove, the blue there. Um, but if they're around, you can, you can dig your hand in just almost any piece of sediment and pull up a dozen of them in your hand, you know, do that again and again there. So, and stepping on them, you, you, you can't avoid stepping on them if you're walking around in an area like that. Um, they do close up. They have a fairly strong shell, so it's probably not going to hurt many of them. The babies probably would, would you know, they haven't built a strong shell that are, are probably going to get broken a little bit. Um, they seem to have these, these kind of boom and bust die-offs that you'll have a whole bunch in your area. For example, there at the, at the boat launch at Lake Ozette, uh, at first, there were, uh, you know, uh, Pat Crane went over there and sampled a square meter and found several hundred in the square meter. Um, we came during the time we were doing our survey. There were we could not find any live in that area. They just ha can have a whole bunch of them. And then suddenly there's this die-off that happens. And low oxygen is one thing. In other places, it's not even obvious. Was there low oxygen here? Well, why did they all die off? And other places uh, here and there, we'd find a patch where there's a whole bunch of dead corbicula there. And around it, it's like 
the native plants, uh, the native clams, and the native plants are dead too. It's like they're, mm. you know, they had a big die off and they poisoned the water in that area and, and things are, are not surviving well there. That was actually going beyond the question you were actually asking. Yeah, so no, that that's, that that's real interesting to see that cycle of of boom and bust. Uh, other, we see that in other uh, other organisms, both terrestrially and, and, and aquatic organisms as well. So it's an interesting um, thing to think about. And what that might mean for our native, um, for our native uh, plants and animals. All right. Well, um, David, it doesn't look like we've gotten any other questions in the chat, so um, I will give some folks a, a few more minutes. Maybe they're in there typing right now, but um, I just wanted to thank you for. Uh, your time this evening um, to prepare and to present um, on your work that you've been doing. Do you have plans to come back and continue the um, the monitoring uh, of the of corbicula on the peninsula? Well, I think it, it's it's important to kind of keep track of what's happening there, and I do have some questions that that could appropriately that that may help. Uh, in getting an idea of how they spread from place to place, uh, not by spreading them, but uh -huh. by, by by testing ways they may be spreading on their own, and especially in something like Lake Crescent, where it's you know it's spreading down the lake. Uh, have some ideas of some experiments to set up there to to find out what is the mechanism by which they're moving. It, is it mainly carried by boats, or are they they getting themselves? How did they get out to those islands? You know, in, in Lake Ozette. Are they able to do that on their own, or is that is that human mediated to do that? That could be an important question to answer to ask. I think. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, maybe uh, maybe there's a future um, master's student or PhD student uh, on the uh, on the on the presentation uh, on the Zoom uh, who who will pick that up and and. Uh, get in touch with you or or maybe it'll be a citizen science project i'm not sure that would be interesting that would be yeah. interesting to do yes yeah all right well um thank you again um and thanks everyone for your time this evening for coming out and um for um, joining our um, winter perspective series we look forward to putting together a series for you again um next winter starting in november um and we will probably uh if things could continue the way they are, we'll be doing that in person at the library again. Um, so we'll resume our in-person um, series and uh, we'll have to see if we can do a hybrid so that we can present it uh, digitally as well for folks that can't join us here. It certainly, it makes it easier to get presenters when they don't have to come all the way from wherever they're located all the way out to Port Angeles here on the peninsula. So thank you for your time, David, and thank everyone else for your time. And um, uh, yeah, thank, thanks so much. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you for listening.